tried to remember the words and couldn't do it. Huh? Yeah, I'm not alone. Amen. Uh, are you ready to take a Bible? Get one. Okay. Revelation 19. Uh, take a look up on the screen. Okay. I'm going to make this real easy for you. Real easy. Um, we've all had, everybody's had tests in school, right? And my favorite ones were true and false, okay? And um, the teacher knows, and the question knows, it assumes a fact that there really doesn't need to be any argument about. If something is true, it's true. If something is not true, it's false. So the teacher would add, on the test would be a list of questions. And you would have to answer, you know, be a, a, well, actually it wouldn't be a question. It would be a statement. And the statement, you had to decide based upon what you learned, what the teacher taught, what the book said. You had to decide whether or not that that statement was true or false. It's very simple, okay? And on a true and false test, when the teacher grades it or when you answer it, there's never a percentage given of how much of the statement might be true and how much is false. Because the, the test would have one sentence on there. And it may be that part of that sentence is saying something right. But the rest of it is totally false. And if you would have read the material, you would have listened to the teacher, you would have taken notes, you would know that. So it just says, is this true or false? And you don't put on there, well, this phrase is actually 40% true and 60% false. If you do that, the teacher marks it wrong because you're trying to get out of it. Right? Because you could say of any of these true and false. Well, it's actually 20% true here. So that means it's 80% false, but it's actually true and false simultaneously at the same time. And the teacher doesn't grade it that way. If you got it wrong, the teacher doesn't say, well, 80% of this is wrong, but 20% of it is right, so I'm gonna only going to give you 80% of this one question. And if you said it was wrong, the teacher said, well, you're right in that, but I'm only going to give you 40% of a point for this question because the rest of it was wrong. Teachers don't do that, do they? If, you, if the statement was false and you marked it as true, it's wrong. Right? Am I right? Who remembers the last true or false test you had? Aren't there some on the driver's exam? Are there some on the CDL, Jared? True and false? And, they didn't, and the instructor didn't say, well, 60% of this statement is in fact true, and the rest of it's false. So I'm only going to give him 60% of it. If, you, if it's true, and you said it's false, you got it wrong. Doesn't matter how much of it might have been right. If you got it wrong, you got the whole thing marked off. Does everybody see what I'm saying? Those of you who are here in Sunday school, raise your hand. You see where I'm going. So I started setting everybody up in Sunday school with this issue. If a statement is true, it's true. And never false. If something is false, then it is totally false and it's never true. See how simple that is? I can see in this country blurring the difference between true and false. Stand up. See this guy here? Come on. It's going to be easy. 
He's a man. All right, you can sit down. How much of what I said is true? 100%. Okay. Can your wife stand up? Okay. This lady here is a woman. Okay. Have a seat. How much of that statement is true? 100%. In this country, you have people who want to blur the line between male and female. God created a male, and then God created a female. They are not the same. They're not designed to be the same. Even though in their chromosomes, there's only, out of 46 chromosomes, there's only one that's different. In the male, we would have had 46 X chromosomes. But God gave us one Y chromosome. And that makes the difference between what is a male and and what a female is. One chromosome. So, if the DNA test reads that they have 46 X chromosomes, it's a female. If the DNA test reads that it has 45 X chromosomes and one Y chromosome, it's a male. And we don't argue that. So, the guy... Who, uh, d who did the protest out in Hillsboro last year where he decided that if he put a dress on and a wig, that that gave him the right to go into a woman's, no, I won't say woman, a girl's bathroom and a girl's locker room and a girl's shower. If he thinks that that gives him the right to do that, his own chromosome argues against him. And shame on the members of the Hills Girl School, School Board who favored his decision to put a dress and a wig on and go into the girl's shower. I'd have yanked my girl out just like that. Some did. See, there are absolutes whether some people want to agree with them or not. There are some things that are just yay and some things that are nay. It's, it would be sort of, if you, if you now, if you want to believe, if you have fallen in to the stupidity that is in this culture that says a man can be a woman or a woman can be a man, then along the same argument, you can then change which hand is left and which hand is right. Just on your own. You can change what you designate as the right hand and what you designate as the left hand. When you go in court, when you go in court, and they tell you to do what? Why? Raise your right hand. Uh, this is how I feel my right hand is today. No, 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 no. Left is left and right is right. How far away, when God took my sins away, how far away did he cast them? as far as east is from the west. You see, east is east and west is west. And you can't just on a whim or how you feel a certain day or what you've been taught, you cannot change what direction is east and you cannot change what direction is west. They're universal. They are accepted everywhere all over the planet. And just because you woke up one day and decided that east and west were going to be different with you, that doesn't, the whole world, are you listening to me? The whole world does not have to bow down and bend 
just because you decide that west is a different direction. Same thing. The whole world does not have to bow down and bend to you simply because you think something is true that's false or you think something is false that's true. Nor does the world have to bend or bow down to you because you think something that's wrong is right and or something that's right is wrong. So, President of the United States says, we're going to build a wall to keep out people who want to come in and harm our nation because if they want to come into this nation, they should do it legally. It's the law of the United States of America. And when he said it, the people who know the difference between right and left went. <laughs> and the people who don't know the difference were going. Yeah. <laughs> Not pointing out to anybody in particular, mind you. <laughs> Did you get that on camera, Michael? You got it. Revelation 19. It's going to make sense in a minute. Verse 11. I saw heaven open. And behold a white horse. He that sat upon him was called faithful and what? True. See that? Faithful and true. If he's true, he's never wrong. He can never be wrong. He never has been wrong. And he never will be wrong. Ever. See, I, I, I have compassion on people who disagree with me. I have compassion and I love people, seriously, who don't, agree right now that white is white and black is black because I know the change that God has made in me in my life whereas at one time I saw things messed up and I believe that God can take our minds and set things right you see it, it, it's, it's, it's humanity it is us in our nature to have blurred areas and gray areas of things that we're not positive are right and wrong, black and white, left and right, things like that. It's natural for us to be that way. But the more you know Christ, the more you know His Word, the more you know the nature and character of God, over time what God does is He diminishes the gray area. And you start taking questions that you've had in your mind and you start setting them in the right and the wrong, let's see, this is right, in the right box and then in the wrong box. And the things that at one time in your life you used to think were right, they're in the wrong box. And as you grow in Christ, you start taking things and putting them in the right place. How many of y'all know that? See, it's, that's, that's everybody. It's my job to teach you right and wrong and to be patient while God sorts that out in your life. And patient I have to be. I have to be as patient with you as I want you to be with me. Because 20 years ago, 22 years ago, when I first stood behind this pulpit as pastor of this church, I had a lot in a gray area. A lot. And people judged me back then, and I guess they were right. But over time, God has helped me take things, issues out of my life, my, my family, our church, this and that and the other, and start putting them in the right box. Okay? 
And I'm not saying that I've got it all straight. I've got it all figured out. Nobody does. So in saying what I'm going to say today, I have a lot of mercy and compassion and patience on people. If you don't really agree 100%, I'll just wait till you agree 100%. Okay? But there's some people, won't mention any names, who will never get things right. Never will. Too much power, too much money, too much control, too much prestige in it. Never get things right. And we live in a country that at one time had a lot, not everything, had a lot of things put in the right box. Some of it was in the wrong box. We didn't do everything right. No country does. But we used to have some things in the right place. Now we don't. Now we don't. So I can't say that we're better as a country because now there's way too much gray stuff in this, what was that book, Fifty Shades of What? I have not read it. I have not seen the movie. I have no desire to. I don't even want to know what it's about. But when you start telling me something about Fifty Shades of Gray, I don't buy it. It's either black or white, right or wrong. If Jesus is faithful and true, two things cannot ever be applied or assumed of him. He can never be unfaithful and he can never be untrue. I could dismiss you now. That would be the lesson for today. But I won't. Where was I? Verse 12. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns, and he had a name written that no man knew but himself. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called, look, what was his name called? Word of, Word of God. So here's what you do. If you love Jesus, say amen. amen. You have a high regard of Jesus, say amen. amen. Your regard for his word must be on the same level as your regard for Jesus, for the person of Jesus himself. But you cannot say that you believe one thing about Jesus and believe a lesser thing about his word. Because who does God say he is? He is faithful and true, and he is the word of God. Have you ever known somebody that had like four names? John, Frederick, Patrick, James. Four names. And amongst a, a group when he was growing up, they all knew him by Johnny. But when he got in college, he didn't want to be called Johnny anymore. He wanted to be called Frederick. Sounded important, like he could get a job with that name. And when he got married, the girl that married him, John, Frederick, Patrick, called him Pat or Patty. Patrick. Maybe not. But anyway. And the people that work for him call him Mr. James. So if, one, if his mom calls and says, is Johnny there? And people are going, who's Johnny? Who's Johnny? Oh, that's his mom. She called him Johnny. It's Mr. James. Uh, yes, he's here. Okay. You see what I'm saying? A guy has different names. People call it, but it's the same guy. Same guy. So he's Jesus Christ. He is King of Kings. He is wonderful. Because the Bible said his name shall be called Wonderful. His name is Counselor. His name is Mighty God. His name is Everlasting Father. His name is Prince of Peace. His name is Rose of Sharon. His name is Ancient of Days. His name is Lord. His name is Faithful. His name is True. And His name is the Word of God. And every one of those names apply to the exact same person. You call him what you want to call him. I call him what I want to call him. But at the end of the day, he's Jesus. He's the Son of God. He's the Son of Man. He's the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And he's the Word of God. And you cannot separate those two. Now are you ready to be dismissed? Cut it out.
Oh, wait a minute. You got DVDs to hand out, don't you? Verse 14, the armies which are in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. Out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nation. I would never get into an argument with a man who out of his mouth comes a sharp sword. He's got, he'll cut you to pieces. Amen? Anyway, verse, uh, oh, look at this. Verse 16, he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And I saw an angel standing in the sun. He cried with a loud voice, saying to all the fowls that fly in the midst of heaven, Come and gather yourselves together unto the supper of the great God, that you may eat the flesh of kings, the flesh of captains, the flesh of mighty men, the flesh of horses, them that sit on them, the flesh of all men, both free and bond, both small and great. And I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies got together to make war against him that sat on the horse and against his army. And the beast was taken and with him the false prophet that wrought miracles before him with which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast and them that uh, worshipped his image. Those, these both were cast alive into the lake of fire burning with brimstone and the remnant were slain with the sword of him that sat upon the horse which seated out of his mouth and all the fowls were filled with their flesh. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, I pray, Lord, you bless the message. Lord, I think I've probably preached enough already. But Lord, this stuff is good. It's good. And I don't want to short anybody. I don't want to leave anybody out. But God, Jesus is true. He's always true. He's every day true. He's always been true. It's true right now. And he always will be true. The Jesus that we serve is not the same as the whims of this world, God. Thank you, Jesus, for all being true to your people and true for your people. Thank you always for that. Lord, bless the message. I, show me where to go from here. Show me what to say. Show me what to do. And I thank you, Lord, for the word that you've already given us. Bless your name. Bless your word. Magnify your word above your name. I pray this in the name of Jesus, our Lord and our Savior, and all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. Give me a minute here. I, uh, yeah, let me do this. Are you ready to turn in your Bible? I'm going to show, I'm going to walk you down a little trail here and I'm going to show you some things, okay? Turn to 1 John 1, 5. John, 1 John 1, 5, okay? There is, there is how the world sees everything and then there's how God sees everything. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you how God sees things, okay? And I, I, I was setting the platform for this during Sunday school and, um, what I'm doing, there's a reason behind it. And I'm setting you up like a lawyer would in a courtroom. I'm going to lay out some, some prime evidence. And then I'm going to give you the summation of it. Okay? And uh, I'm not going to be a false prophet setting you up. I'm going to tell you things. And I'm going to tell you why I'm telling you this. And, and then you'll understand where I'm going. First John chapter 1 verse 5. Here's what the Bible says. This then is the message which we have heard of him and declare unto you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. Now, here's how God sees everything. Here's how God is. God is 100% light. Not 80% light. 90% light. Not 99% light. Not 99 and 100 thousandth over, whatever. He's all light. Is there any darkness in God at all? No. So it's the same as this. Up on the screen, right? God is true and in him is no falseness. And I could say it that way, couldn't I? God is true and in him there is no falseness or nothing false at all. Correct? Is God ever wrong? Has God ever made a mistake? Has God ever sinned? Did God ever look down upon women and say, Boy, she's the best looking of them. I wish I had her. Has God ever done that? He doesn't do that. He is God. And there is no dark side to God at all. This is how God sees everything that is. Everything that God sees 
that he declares that he is is absolute in a world that doesn't want to believe in absolutes anymore. And there's a real good reason why the world doesn't want to believe in anything absolute. Because if, if religion, if church has been saying adultery is wrong, it is evil, and it is immoral, the people who commit adultery don't want to believe that. Why? Because they want to commit more adultery, not less. They want to keep doing it. And they want to not feel bad or guilty over it. So they want to say, I think some adultery is okay. Or I think adultery under this condition is all right. Or, my favorite one, who are you to judge that that's wrong? God said, thou shalt not commit adultery. Did God ever say, except this, or unless this happens? Did God ever say that? When there's a display of the Ten Commandments, and it says, thou shalt not commit adultery, is there a blank space for us to write whatever we want to write in after that and say, well, except under these conditions, uh, and, it's, and if you fall under this condition right here, then it's okay for you to commit adultery. The answer is no. It's wrong. It was always wrong, it is now wrong, and it was always be wrong, and it doesn't matter how many people say it's right, it doesn't matter how many people in Hollywood, it doesn't matter how many people make records and videos and, and songs that sing about adultery and portray it as okay. And I'm not just talking about rap music, I'm talking about country music, I'm talking about any kind of music that would ever say to anybody that adultery is okay, that song is wrong. What have we got going in our country? Time when you, adultery used to be wrong. And now we've got the singers out there going, If loving you is wrong, I don't want to be right. That's not a rap song, is it? That wasn't ACDC. That's hillbilly music. God said it's wrong. And in God, there's no adultery at all. God's always light and he's never darkness you ever seen that yin yang symbol that circle with the it's got black on one side kind of curled up and it's got it on the other side kind of curled up and it's got a black dot and a white dot in the middle of it you know what that means it represents a religious idea where right and wrong are equals because right and wrong fill up an equal space in there where black and white are equal Light and darkness are both equal. And light and darkness can both be in the same place at the same time. The God of that religion is both light and dark at the same time. Our God is all light and no dark. And this is how God sees the world. Are you with me? Okay. Number two, James chapter two, verse 10. Turn there. James chapter two, verse 10. I'm going to give you this. I'm going to cut you loose. Okay? I'm setting you up. I'm going to teach you something. And you believe it. And if you believe it, the world cannot tear it down for you. Because the world's going to try. They're always young people. The world is always going to try to destroy right and wrong in your mind. Let's have some adults say amen to that. Has it been tried with us in our generation? Then it's going to be tried with them. It's going to be done by a school teacher. It's going to be done by a rap artist. It's going to be done by a book that, that is popular among children. It's going to be done by movies. It's going to be done by video games. It's going to be done by everything imaginable that can reach into that child's mind and influence them. There's always going to be things they're going to try to destroy <clears throat> absolutes from your child's mind. James chapter 2 verse 10. For whosoever shall keep the whole law and yet end in one point, he is guilty of all. Do you agree with that? Did Moses keep the whole law? Moses gave the law. Moses gave the law people. 
Why didn't Moses get to go into the promised land? God only named one sin that Moses did that kept him out of the promised land. What was it? Not murder. He struck the rock and he was supposed to speak to it. One sin kept the greatest lawgiver. Lo Moses is such a great icon of the law and the judicial system that our Supreme Court has notched into that wooden door that goes into the Supreme Court room the emblem of Moses and the Ten Commandments. Meaning, this is where we get our laws from. And God, when God disallowed Moses from going into the... Everybody else got to go, except Moses. God disallowed Moses from going in for one sin that he committed. Don't tell me how good you are. God says that man at his altogether best state is vanity. Meaning there ain't a one of us. There ain't a one of us that qualifies to go into heaven. There is, however, one. His name is Jesus Christ. How many sins did Jesus commit? Zero. Zero. No sins. He qualifies. We don't. So is it true that if a man keeps the whole law, like Moses, and yet offends in one point, he's guilty of all? Do you agree with that? And yet with people who want to put levels and layers and they want to put, they want to attach scores to different sins that people commit and say, well, that's a little sin. It only has a little score. It doesn't count for much. God did not say in his word, sin or big sin. He said, sin. And your disobedience is the same as my disobedience. One sin. You don't go. One sin. That's how God sees it. It is all or nothing with God. So this truth thing. Can Jesus be true and called true if he didn't say everything true? Be called true if he said one thing wrong. Nope. Not according to God's standard. Turn to Ezekiel 33. Ezekiel 33. Verse 13, I shall say to the righteous that he shall surely live if he trust to his own righteousness and commit iniquity. All his righteousness shall not be remembered, but for his iniquity that hath committed, he shall die for it. How does God see everything? God sees everything black and white. God sees everything in absolutes. Yea and nay. What is it that Jesus told us when he told us not to swear any oaths? But he said, but let your yea be yea and your nay be nay. In other words, why is it that I have to swear that I'm going to... If I have a reputation that everything that I say is yea and nay, which means I'm always going to tell the truth, then I don't have to swear that now, at this point, I'm going to tell the truth. I always tell the truth. Oh, wish we had like that walking around. But no, we got to swear that we're going to tell the truth this time because there is an understanding that men do not tell the truth. Amen, ladies? That was your turn. Men don't always tell the truth. The best men in this church don't always tell the truth. The best ladies in this church don't always tell the truth. That's why we got to swear to it when we go into court. 
because our yea is not yea and our nay is not nay. So, if a man has, he's done all righteousness, he's got all this righteousness going, if he commits one iniquity, what happens to all his righteousness? It's going to be remembered. It's done away with, and he's going to die for one iniquity. That's how God sees it. Not, well, God said, okay, I'll let you, I'll let you get away with 20 iniquities. But after 20, I'm cutting it off. Because you know what, man? God, can we have 30? Like kids, right? You hand them a dollar. Can I have two? Wait a minute, you asked for a dollar. Yeah, but can I have two? Right, Braxton? Did I get his name right? Braxton? <laughs> He's going to say it, no matter what. Turn to Corinthians chapter 6. I'm almost done. I'm almost done. Second Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14. Be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. Now I'm going to ask you a question. Not in man's version, but in God's version. Can you be called a believer of the Bible if there's one verse you don't believe is true? See, this is what I've been setting up for you. This is what I'm setting up for you. Well, I believe John 3.16. Isn't that good enough? But I don't believe the Noah's Ark fable. And science has already disproven creation account so badly that I can't believe anybody would believe that anymore. Yes, church people say that. Can a person be called by God a true believer if there's something in God that they don't believe? Now, remember what I'm saying to you. God has patience with us, doesn't he? 20 years ago, I would not have said that behind this pulpit. God suffered with me to the day to where I said, God, I believe everything in this book. God waited on me for that. And I'll wait on you. Okay? I'm not condemning anybody. I can't. Because God would have put me out of here a long time ago. But if, you're, if you don't believe part of what God said, God capsules it all at once in one package. There is the Bible. Part of the Bible or... This, the 27 books of the New Testament are the only Bible I have to believe. That's not that way. It is the Bible or it's not the Bible. If you say, I believe it, but you don't really believe everything that it says, then it cannot, you cannot be a believer. So, be not equally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteous with unrighteousness? Remember what God says are the rules? If it's called righteous, and yet it has one sin in it, is it righteous? And if it's called unrighteous, but it does something right, can it be called righteous? What communion hath light with darkness? Is it light? Is, is it light if it's got dark in it? Is it, if it has some light in it? Any place where light exists, darkness does not. Now, it may be for a small place. But it's one or the other. You cannot have it both ways. Light or dark. 
Pick one. True or false? Pick one. Hamburger or cheeseburger? Pick one. I knew it. I knew it. He's, by the way, he's not bothering us. It's all, I'm going to pay him money for help in the message. <laughs> what concord hath Christ with Belial? You know who Belial is? Satan. If it's Christ, it's not Satan. And if it's Satan, it's not Christ. What part hath he that believeth with an infidel? We've already covered that. What agreement hath God with idols? If it's, it's a, if it's a house of God and it has no statues in it, it's the house of God. If they call it a house of God, it's got statues in every corner, it's not the house of God. Ye are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk in them and I will be their God and they shall be my people. Wherefore, come be ye what? So it's going to be God's people. Boy, you saw that during that speech, didn't you? You saw... I don't care what you think about the man, Donald Trump. What he said Thursday night, I have no disagreement with it. And you saw what America is like by looking at the Hall of Congress and seeing that it was clearly divided. Even when one of them old liberal Democrats, Trump said something and he was about to stand up and he looked around and he went... He wasn't about to, he wasn't about to, to, to say amen to that because all of his cronies would have run him out. Listen, if you believe in something, stand for it. I'm going to let you out here in a minute. Be ye separate, saith the Lord, touch not the unclean thing and I will receive you. That is God's requirement. You touch an unclean thing. God knows it. Now, see this book? This is the word of God. God. Can we call it true if Genesis is not right? Can we call it true if John 3.16 is not right? Here's what I'm asking. Is Jesus the only begotten Son or the one and only Son of God? Which is it? Because you're talking about two different people. Jesus is not the one and only Son of God. We are also sons of God with Him. He is the only begotten Son. Can the Jesus in the fiery furnace be the Son of God or a Son of the gods? He's one or the other. Is your Bible right in every thing that it says. If God said that the book was without error in it, then you must that his word never lies. And it's never wrong. So, my challenge to you, get it straight. And, you, and, and if I'm not preaching to you, I'm not preaching to you. But the come in and throw confusion in your mind, doesn't he? He, ha he does it with me all the time. Is the Bible, can the Bible, seeing what we know about God, can the Bible then be wrong one time? Not according to the way God sees it. And say, oh yeah, all the Bibles are wrong. That's not what God said. And we're dealing with a God who deals only in absolutes. Now, he may want to teach you for a while and bring you to it like he did me. But the bot at the end of the day, or let's say at the end of your life, you've got to make a decision. You either believe the whole or you don't believe the whole. It's that simple. Amen? Stand to your feet. I'll give you a little bit more of this tonight, if you'll come. If you'll come tonight, I'll give you some more of this. I'll show you what I'm talking about. Just with every head bowed and every eye closed, I'm not even going to do a...
I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand. I'm not guilty about anything. I'm trying to get you to think. I'm trying to get you to think the way God thinks. The way God sees it. Because we are supposed to be given the mind of Christ. As believers. Which means that as God instructs us, we are to see things God's way of seeing. Not the world's way. Not social media's way. Not what's popular. But we're to see things God's way. On every issue. So, anybody hearing my voice today, in your mind, if there are gray issues, I'm with you, I really am. I'm for you all the way. Because I know what that's like. And to be honest with you, there are some things that, right, I can't preach about them because I'm not sure. If I get sure, then I'll, I promise you I'll start preaching about them. That God has to teach them to me, and I have to know them. And it's not God said, I believe everything God said. My problem is, I'm not sure that I understand everything God said. So that creates a cloud. Clouds are always gray. So if there's anything in your life, in your mind, or in your heart, where there is a gray area, you can tell God, and He won't be mad at you. Because all of us are like that. All of us had those gray areas. And over time, I promise you, God, he's going to put it the true or the false, the right or the wrong, the white or the black, the day or the night, good or evil. God's going to fix it for you and show you what side it's going to be on. So let's pray to that end.